into uh, what we're now calling Deep Dive. Uh, and uh, this is Ask the Masters. Um, I'm Dave from Fluid Dynamics, uh, and we got a really, really cool project today. I actually have not seen this presentation. Rick has done it a number of times, uh, but the pool that you see on the screen is going to be amazing. And uh, this is Rick with Red Rock Contractors and also with Ask the Masters. And we've also got, just so everybody knows, we got Art Minty. He is one of the, uh, well, Art, actually put your speaker on and just introduce yourself before we uh, get moving. Hey, hello. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Dave and Jason for having us all on today. I'm Art Minty. I'm the Senior Director of Technical Services with Lady Creek International. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, learning exactly what Rick did here with this build. It looks great. So, and Jason, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm Jason Jovag with uh, Quarter Glazing International. Uh, we do underwater pool windows. Uh, we supplied and installed the three viewing panels that are shown on the project here with Rick. Uh, look forward to talking to you guys about the windows and how that interfaces with the pool structure as well as the waterproofing systems. The whole point of this whole time is for uh, for us to walk you through step by step from the design process all the way through construction and to really give everybody kind of a thorough understanding of some of these really highly complex projects and, and some of the challenges. And, and the goal is to, uh, to better all of us. Um, like I said earlier, I'm very much looking forward to this. I have not seen this presentation myself. And so I'm, I'm here uh, as a participant as well to learn. So um, go ahead and take it away, Rick. So we're going to get, we're going to show this in a minute too, but this is the formwork of the back of our shell, but we've got these embeds as well, all the way down the pool. We had to now support a deck system after we build our shell. So our shell supports itself and then it supports a portion of the deck. And so um, those are now set into our shotcrete shell. Um, you can see we've actually shot in the bottom of this section. You can see the foam in the foreground that is under the Baja shelf to lighten our weight. Um, and we've, we've shot the first, section of this as we come around and we're going to come back and build the walls up from there. This is just an underside view to give you kind of an idea. These, these are the big steel beams you see in the, in the center of that picture that we were dealing with and how to get around. And then you can start to see our plumbing that's not complete yet. And I wanted to make a kind of a critical thing we're doing here. This is a gravity drain. And I think it's about eight inches by the time we get here, but you notice that we've got a valve and a pressure gauge on it, even though, it's going to be a gravity drain. It's again, it's over architectural finish structure, right? So there's no pressure on this line. It would probably never ever leak no matter what, but we're going to make sure we pressure tested it and left it under pressure during shotcrete and everything else. So we know that we don't have a bad joint. We'll never be able to get back in here easily to solve a problem for the client. And we certainly don't want to have damage to any vehicles or, or house or home, home finishes or anything. So you just drilled and tapped those in um, mm -hmm. to, to make sure and capped on both ends. Yeah, well, it's capped here, and then it's actually all those four, those th four inch drops coming out of the gutter. Each one of them has their cap on currently, and so we sh we put it all under pressure during the shot creep process. Take it off to finish the line run, and then put it back under pressure. But yeah, absolutely, very simple. You can also see the two different pores here. Um, this section here is what you see is the original floor pour. And then you can see where our secondary shotcrete is above that. So obviously we got a rough edge here, but we left that edge heavy and rough with a lot of surface profile. So we could get very good teeth when we, when we actually come back and shoot later. Um, when we do multiple shoots, um, we're going to, I'm going to show some other images too, but there's a, the process is critical. It's not just, Oh, if it's shotcrete, we can do it two days in a row. You've got to make sure everything's planned for and everything's done correctly. So, um, the most important thing is having concrete surface profile that's got enough meat to it and teeth. And the, the two things concrete surface profile does for us, that's basically, if you don't know what that is, that's a rating of how rough the surface is from one to 10, I believe. Um, we've actually got little, little uh, scale um, samples of what that should look like. When we get a higher surface profile, more rough surface, we get both mechanical bonding when we shoot to it. But the, the other benefit of that surface profile is we get extra surface area, right? So if you look at a piece of sandpaper and if you could measure the surface area of a piece of sandpaper versus a piece of paper, the difference would be tenfold, right? Those little, all those little journals create a massive amount of surface area. And when we want to connect two actual systems together, the surface area helps do that dramatically. And so that's piece one. Piece two is making sure we have that surface, surface saturated dry, right? or saturated surface dry, I'm sorry. So meaning we've got the, whatever surface we're going to shoot against is completely saturated to a point of not being able to accept any more water, but absolutely no standing water. 
Now, shotcrete will blow that standing water out of your way usually, but for the most part, you got You want to make sure you didn't just mist it with a hose the day, but while you're shooting, you want it saturated. You want to make sure that it cannot accept any more water. The reason for that is we don't want the receiving surface to suck water away from the new shotcrete. We want them to cure properly, and we want that receiving surface to not affect the actual cure. The other thing we want to make sure we're doing, and you can see in the image we currently have up, we've got a guy with a blow wand. So the benefit of casting floors first, obviously everybody too, is we can stand on top of here, we can trim on top of here, we can easily get all our trimmings out. Um, this guy with the blow wand is making sure that any latency or any, any rebound or any material that's piling up on the steel before we can get to it or piling up in the joint, we can blow out of there completely. So we have a second compressor on site that's got its own air supply and somebody guiding that the whole process to make sure we do not leave. As you work from left to right, you continue to pile material, 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 and you start ending up with, with dry, non-solid concrete that gets piled up on top of pipes under, under steel on top of steel. So you absolutely need somebody in most situations of a two day shoot, you want somebody keeping the steel clean and the receiving surfaces clean. So if you can see this area here is gonna, by the time we get there is gonna have a pile of crap laid on top of it, right? We're not gonna have good, honest receiving surface. So before he gets there, we'll bring that blow wand in and completely blow any loose material or any un, you know starting to cure material loose and then we'll come in and be able to shoot it in place this just gives you a little bit obviously we're stepping and walking around we're gonna be able to shovel all this crappy material out of here that's been trimmed off these walls we won't have to worry about it being stomped into a floor and compromising our structure so that's why we did a two-day shoot on this job even though it's not a very big job it made it much more uh the, made that floor much more substantial for us and gave us a lot less issues with bad concrete you can see our toe kick drain. So we got no drains in the floor of this pool because we're only 12 inches thick. So we've used channel drains here. There's one along the side here and there's one in the foreground here, obviously. So, and then some returns and lights, et cetera. Um, these, are, these are floor returns, I believe. That's what they are. Um, and then we have some returns out of the side as well. So here is what is in the shotcrete phase, at least you can see this is our little drain detail. You can kind of see a little piece of foam that's kind of stuffed in the hole still. And then this larger rebate is what's going to accept our acrylic panels. And so we've got a continuous rebate up the sides and down the floor that gives us support for our panel. Those rebates are considerably larger than the acrylic itself because we're going to give up, make, there's a whole detail put together. Jason will go through that a little bit. We actually get our rebate size based on size of panel, length of panel, all those things affect. Acrylic is extremely more expansive in the heat than any other than the concrete structure itself. So we've got to make up for that amount of expansion from thermal issues and cooling in hot um, and, and just, you know, a, a fixed structure that's so rigid and one that's not. So we are working through that as we go. You can see also talk you can a little see, bit real quick. Yep. Uh, go back to that photo before. Sure. Um, uh, how do you create that rebate? Uh, is that hand cut in the field? Are you putting foam in there? Uh, because that's, it needs to be fairly critical. Uh, and, and you, you know, that's a nice clean cut right there. How are you guys doing it? I know there's so, a number of different yeah, ways we've, to do it. We've, we've, we've seen it done numbers of ways. 99% of the time for us, we try to cut it into a solid wall. We shoot the wall and then cut our rebate. Um, anytime we try to cast these in place or try to put a placeholder in and shoot around them, if you're casting it, you can use blockouts pretty easily because you can vibrate and get really good consolidation. If you're shooting a pool, um, any pool that we've been on, we did one in Hawaii with Jason, we've got one in, in uh, LA with him right now. And, and when they've cast those sections, there is, or I mean, when they shoot those sections that they actually try to put a rebate hold like a piece of foam or a blockout, they end up with substantial problems with the concrete there. This, this is the most critical piece of our waterproofing structure is the structure behind the waterproofing. It's got to be great. And that substrate has to be really strong. And what we usually find if someone tries to form this and shoot around the forms, they end up with quite a bit of voids and shadowing behind the forms. And then they pull the forms out. And then before Jason gets to show up and check the rebates, they've done all this patchwork and hidden all these defects. Um, and again, the waterproofing failure is very likely, if there is a failure, is likely to happen from substrate failure, not being able to take the structure, not hold the weight. So in this situation, we carved those out of the shotcrete. Once we cut it in, we carved them out. Um, and we did the same in the floor. And I've had great success doing that. I've yet to see large rebates be able to be 
shot with 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 blockouts it just doesn't work very well for for anything any of the jobs we've seen even jobs we didn't construct but we've been consulting on so i'm sure jason jason if you want to jump in you can give us a little more feedback on that and, and correct me if i made terrible mistakes no no you're, you're good um yeah as long as i mean when we start dealing with some of the radius walls and things like that um i would recommend you know if we can get some sort of form work on it just especially when we're dealing with some of the, the complex radiuses but things that are you know plumb level square as long as we got straight lines and 90 degree corners you know that's that's what we're looking for but from the constructability yeah you, you kind of touched on the waterproofing side of it we do want to make sure the structure is sound so you know rock pockets and voids and, and poor concrete consolidation uh, we want to see all of that before we get on site. Now, the reason is I'd rather repair it ourselves or take a look at it so we know exactly what we're getting. Uh, I don't want to, you know, brown coat it or, or over the top. So we could potentially, when it is loaded, have, like you said, the substrate failure. Yeah, and I think Art can answer things... to that. Art can answer that too. I mean, the, the when if you do have voids, especially in areas like this, it's, there, that's not an issue. We can manage the issue, but we have to manage it correctly. And if and there's there's plenty of products that can give us bulletproof repair. To, to shadowing and voids. But what I've seen happen um, on multiple projects and actually the one we worked on in Hawaii, I went and looked at it before Jason got there and they had tried to correct some of the voids. Um, and I was able to chip them out with a little hammer and, and find holes everywhere because they just, they didn't, they didn't tear down to the, to the solid structure. They just filled some voids they could see. And a lot of the, the surface wasn't solid. And so we made them come back and, and go in there with a chipping hammer and strip it down to a good solid substrate and then come back and do a legitimate patch. Um, and I, Art, Art can, his company provides all kinds of products for those kind of solutions. Um, but please don't hide that from Jason or, your, or, or anybody else for that matter. There is a good repair method. Get your rep on site and ask for some help. Yeah, and one of the things that, that um, as we're starting to do acrylic panels as well, um, uh, I have found that, that when you cut that, uh, it's a pretty important timing too. If you cut it too early, uh, when you still have a lot of plasticity to the mud, um, you can create the internal fractures. Um, and we just had one where um, we actually came back in and, and, and chipped the whole thing out and I bring, brought the shot creep back out, crew back out. We came in and actually physically cut it the following morning while it was still, it was firm um, and it was hard, uh, but it wasn't fully cured. Um, and uh, it, it, because something like this, getting, um, you know, nice, clean surfaces and that, that just makes Jason's job so much easier as he's coming in. He doesn't have to do a lot of prep, especially, you know, with some of the smaller, thinner windows. If you've only got a three inch rebate and, and you got to do some repair work, uh, it becomes more of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the form work, when you form some of these too, you also run into a very smooth surface profile. So actually you got to come back and actually increase the surface profile with a, with a needle file or, or needle um, hammer. So those can, those all can be in effect, but it's definitely a timing issue. And, and each project, like Jason said, is going to, it's going to depend on the project. What's the best solution to your current situation. Obviously some things can't be randomly cut, um, especially if you don't have lines or control lines and if it's a radius or, or a custom lady, lay, layer. So um, I'm showing this detail just because we, we do our toe kick detail quite a bit in our spas. And, and one of the things we use in this can, scenario is we actually put in a piece of foam. And so once the floor was shot, we could, we could glue these pieces of foam down with just a little bit of mastic and then we can shoot around them. And the problem, that way the face of this doesn't want to fall. Initially we were trying to trim or cut to those and we definitely would have failures with those. I will tell you that we we also make those foam panels. They are not square. They are slightly, um, slightly angled back so we can they're they're a mother to get out it's i've seen people try to do it with wood forming too and the wood gets wet and swelled i mean you can in a small spa to, this one's got good access but on a square or round spa and you do a lot of really custom wood form work in there trust me you'll spend two weeks getting that shit back out i mean it's it's really tough and so don't you can get foam profiles in any shape and size just give them a seat a, 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 a drawing of it they'll see and see it for you they'll wire cut it for you super inexpensive very flexible with what you want to do with it, but it sure makes the job easier. And we don't get any of this any of this material on the on the bench here trying to fall because you can see we got a pretty heavy toe kick here. I think these are eight inches tall and six inches out, so that's a pretty heavy toe kick that would not stay in place and before it cured. So, so you probably remember you seeing in our model we had most of this plumbing modeled in. You can see that had we not stepped this beam right here, we would have we would have ran into some structural problems for sure. We did change the layout of all the uh, bar joists to make them jump over. But now you can start to see all these little tiny embeds that we left in there because we're going to weld to those embeds. 
um, in order to support our structure. And again, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, you want a structural engineer on your project, but you also have to have somebody paying attention. So our structural engineer initially, this is the detail we actually went with, but our initial structural detail was a piece of angle that was mounted here to the top of the bond beam at the back of the gutter. Um, well, this is a big, huge building and this is a big block of concrete and we were sure that we'd end up with a crack right here. And so we came back and requested that we have a way to support this lower in the structure. And so we ended up with a stud and a huge weld plate and then they were able to put a stand and an arm and, and actually support this. So like I said earlier, make sure you're checking your engineers as well. Make sure you see what you, that you feel like what they're doing is going to work and then come back to it. One of the other things we learned on this project, which, which was a little bit of a problem, it hasn't created a lot of problems, but this outside area, this is an outside area of the rooftop deck. And we've got a nice moist pool that likes to flow into this gutter all the time. And this client keeps it about 90 degrees winter or summer. Well, guess what temperature this deck is in the middle of winter in Arizona? It gets down into the mid thirties sometimes. We were getting condensation that would then wick its way into the structure. So I bring that up only because it hasn't caused us a bunch of issue, but there was some moisture found that we had to mitigate um, and it was very hard to get to. So in an outdoor structure with a hot body of water, that, that did become a problem. We were lucky that our stainless steel plate is actually sloping away. So majority of that moisture hadn't entered. There was just a few key areas we had to chip into to fix. So um, we learned that through the construction process for sure. And then actual operation of the pool. Didn't turn out to what be a big problem, but it certainly was. What's that? What would you, if you, if you designed this right now, what would you add? Well, would I think we would- seek a swell under the, yep. uh, between the beam? Yep, we'd have a Sika swell stick right here. We, you know, we didn't have any fear that we'd have a moisture problem. We've waterproofed down through and over. And this gutter is, is well-sized. We've got big dropouts coming out of the gutter. Um, so we weren't concerned about overwhelming it in any way. We never contemplated we'd get a moisture push. So absolutely, the simple solution is a Sika flex sitting underneath this when we mount this, and that would stop any potential migration of moisture. Um, so we did a pretty cool detail um, between the pool and the spa. We actually have what, what, what appears to be mostly seamless. You can't see, but we've got a lot in our edge all the way around the pool and the spa, and they're exactly the same elevation. And so we actually created a tiny little gutter to pop in between the, the pool and the spa. And so this is just a cross section of what that gutter, look, what that stainless piece looked like. We were able to weld and support that in place. Um, and then the water at the top of that gutter is exactly the same height as the water. This, this section here is the same as the Lautner gutter. And so water pours in from the pool and from the spa. In a, and in a typical environment, when we turn the spa into spa mode, we then pull from the spa, return to the spa. So it is no longer overflowing into either gutter, even though the pool and spa gutter are combined. That allows us to, to heat the spa water without any problems. So we, we can set, even though it looks like they're the same level, even though they flow in the same gutter system, that allowed us to have a seamless water line and we'll show that in the final images and yet separate the water. The other little trick we did, because you're gonna end up, anybody knows that when you have a spa, well, we have a perimeter overflow spa and if we put five, 10, 15 people in the spa in or out, we're gonna keep losing water over time. So that water level is gonna get lower and lower as we go, as well as sometimes the camming of the valves is never perfect. And so what we also did is put an inch and a half pipe right through this wall. And that allowed us, so even though we would bring cold water in at lower levels, that spa always stayed completely full and our heaters could certainly manage that little bit of infiltration of water. So it allowed that spa to not continuously drop down. It just allowed that to keep balanced. And here's just some, some general cross section. Since we're doing edge details, I just wanted to cover a few more. The, the top left is essentially the, the standard Lautner detail that we were using on this project. Um, the top right is one that we've also done, which is a two part, two, a double gutter, which allows us to have more splash out. So this is another detail you can work into a Lautner project. If it's a kid pool, or you're gonna get a lot of splash to actually give you another section. That first initial splash that jumps the, jumps the weir here usually falls in here without too many problems. And then these sections here are, are uh, there's openings between them every couple, every couple feet. So the water flows seamlessly between them. Um, this section here is actually a retro Lautner that we've done in the past. I've got another one I'll show too, where we came in and cut down the beam and actually made a Lautner edge out of an existing pool using a, using a, a plate of stainless. Um, we end up with a joint here in our tile. We want to do this with tile if we can. 
but we use a, you know, we use a joint sealer that sealant there for, in, for caulking instead of a grout in case we get a little bit of movement of those two, but steel and concrete move very similarly in temperature. Um, and there's a way, you know, we put a flexible membrane and a fabric across those joints, but that's a trick way to come in and do a Lautner edge detail on an existing pool. And then this one is- One of the questions, oh, yep. finish that one. Yep. And then, uh, and then I, I got a question for you. Sure. This is, and this is essentially what we did at the detail at the spot of the pool. So we've got a stainless steel section created for us. This end of that section, one end of that section is capped. The other end just opens up into the Lautner gutter here. And so this water that flows in there sends itself down the gutter. When we turn it into spa mode, obviously the spa water drops just a little bit and is no longer flowing in the hole, but the pool and the perimeter overflow of the pool maintains operations. So one of the questions came in uh, talking about, um, I figured this was a great place to talk about it, salt water and, and that, uh, and when you're dealing with uh, a lot of uh, stainless structures and that, um, what kind of stainless are you using in here? Uh, and, and what's your thoughts on having salt water as a part of, uh, of, of pools that have like exposed metallic surfaces and, uh, and, and that? I think that's a debate for the for the ages for sure. But in a project where we're using stainless on a swimming pool, we're going to require at, at least a, a three sixteen stainless, which means it's a lower grit or lower iron stainless than average. There's also three sixteen L, which is an even a more substantially lower grade or higher grade. I'm sorry. Um, the price difference is substantial as well. But on any pool project with exposed stainless, we're going to have three sixteen as a minimum. When we're doing like a stainless plate, like you see in this profile. We would be okay with 304 stainless there. It's a lighter grade. It's probably going to rust a little, but it's just going to be surface rust. It's not going to cause destructive damage. Um, but anything exposed like these upper rims here, you know, on top of that Lautner edge in here, those have to be 316 or 316 L, ideally 316 L. The other critical, critical piece of dealing with stainless is anytime you cut it, fabricate it, heat it, any of those things changes the properties of the stainless and removes the protection from it. So you have to come back if it's in, it's in a factory construction, we can do what's called passivation. They can tank it and repassivate it and re-get that, that protection on top of it. If it's in the field, there's pickling products that you can actually pickle any type you weld, grind, and work on to recreate that, that uh, protection layer. The one thing we find people making mistakes with stainless is they, they go in, out of the truck and grab a grinder and just start grinding on it. Well, if that's a grinding wheel that has any iron in it or it's a grinding wheel that was used on something with iron in it, you just plowed a bunch of iron into the edge of the stainless and now you'll never get it out. So working with stainless, you have to be surgical with it. You got to be very careful and you got to make sure that any cuts or any heating or any, anything, even drilling holes in it will, will strip it of some of its properties of stainless, stainless capabilities. And so you got to make sure you're pickling it. It's very simple. You can buy the products, but you got to plan ahead and know what you're dealing with. Um, here is actually a different pool that we did in Hawaii where we had, this is actually the original bond beam height. Um, and we actually just raised the entire structure out of stainless, at, you know, mounted two angles and actually waterproof the inside of the structure and then, and then cantilevered this stainless is not exactly correct. This cantilevered piece of stainless would actually come across here. Um, and then we tiled and floated over the top of another piece of stainless with a, with a bend in it. Um, very, very complicated pain in the ass, but we were able to do, um, able to make our, our Lautner edge detail on an existing pool without completely tearing the structure down. This allowed us to maintain, the structure was very sound, but we weren't comfortable that it was sound enough for us to come in and start hammering it down and really chipping it apart and getting into the steel structure. You know, we'd have rebar and everything in place if we went, it, try to build this into the existing. So um, worked really well, came out as a great detail. So don't be afraid to try, you know, new, new tricks. It's what the cool kids do, so. Um, now we're going to move into...